Okay, so to reiterate, this is Time Ticking 2022. Um, we're delighted this evening to welcome John Stewart from the UK Noise Association. Um, I am chair of Cagney Communities Against Gatwick Noise and Emissions, and we are the umbrella group for Sussex, Surrey and Kent. We work with lots of NGOs in the UK and overseas. And um, I'm going to be handing over um, today to Lisa Morris, who is a Cagney committee member. And tonight's subject is obviously noise. Um, you've all booked it and wonderful that you're all attending. So I'm going to unpin myself from here. And um, if you could keep yourselves on mute um, during this event, um, I'd appreciate it. So over to you, Lisa. Hi, everyone. So noise probably affects more people in their day to day lives than any other pollutant yet it's something that's completely downplayed mm. by so many and often dismissed as no more really than a local and NIMBY issue but tonight we're going to look at the health and quality of life implications of noise as well as considering why these authorities the people in authority get away with sidelining this pollutant and of course as a community key group we will explore what communities can do to get noise more on the table and more of a local issue and more up for discussion so welcome John who we're going to have a, a little bit of a coffee time with so um, bear, bear, bear with us and just pretend that you're sitting in your front room and you're listening to a good old debate about noise. So John all of us here completely understand the passion and personal impact that a cause close to our hearts can have on us and yet you've been spending many many years campaigning. Um, why? What drives you? Well, um, on, on noise issues, I, I think it probably arose from personal experience. Um, I, I, I'm not sure when I was a teenager, Lisa, which is many, many years ago, I was kind of thinking, I, when I grow up, I want to be a noise campaigner. I mean, as teenagers, you just don't think like that. I, I think I've always been a bit sensitive to noise, but... Um, Two things happened really in the late 1990s. Uh, first of all, uh, when I was living in Southeast London, about 17, 18 miles from Heathrow, we hadn't really been disturbed by the aircraft. And there was a change in the flight path. And suddenly, as uh, somebody, uh, one of my neighbors said, it was like a, a motorway opened in the sky above us. And we were having planes, one sometimes one every uh, two minutes. So, so suddenly we had this change, we heard the noise, I became very obviously very aware of it. And at the same time, where I was living in, in the flat, um, it always there was always a, a laundry, not a laundrette, but a proper laundry nearby. And it didn't really make too much of a noise. Uh, but then they installed much bigger uh, uh, machines and they kept them running all night. So during the day, I had the planes. During the night, until 4.30 in the morning when the planes started again, I had the noise of the laundry. And it was, I suppose that was a bit of a, literally a wake up call uh, as to just what noise can do. So I got involved eventually with uh, HACAN, which gives a voice to residents under the Heathrow flight pass. And at the and HACAN, at, uh, around about the year 2000, HACAN in the same year uh, was a founder member of the UK Noise Association, which obviously took up noise uh, on a, a, a broader scale. So can you tell us a little bit more about what the Noise Association does? Yes, I mean, it started out really, um, it was the brainchild of uh, a woman called Val Wheaton, who's now the president of the uh, UK Noise Association. And she had virtually single-handedly for 10 years, 15 years, fought on neighbour noise and was a, a prime mover in getting the 1996 Noise Act, which covers noise at night generally, uh, onto the statute books. But she felt that people from different, fighting different aspects of noise needed to come together. So aircraft noise, neighbour noise, traffic noise, noisy pubs, noise, noise in the street. Um, 
And initially the idea was that we'd become uh, just a broad network, but uh, it became an organization, Val became the, uh, the paid worker for the organization. Uh, we no longer have a paid worker uh, because Phantom Audit would have come by. So we're, we've gone back to what we originally were, is, is a network bringing together uh, different campaigns, different lobby groups, uh, all concerned about different aspects of noise. Excellent. So you've spent a lot of time, haven't you, in and around um, airports, government officials, airport officials, I, I, never, I, I, never to my, I never admitted, Lisa, even to my greatest friends, you know, how, how long <laughs> I've hung around, lurked around airports. <laughs> well, it's now going to be on YouTube, John, so it's, it is, it's, it's out is. in the open now. <laughs> For these officials that you get the pleasure or not of, of, of spending time with, do you really think they understand the impact of aircraft noise on communities? Um, I, I'll deal with the government officials first. Um, I think um, there is there is more understanding amongst government civil servants in the noise department than there was when I started out 20, 25 years ago. Uh, I, I don't think they were interested. I think they simply saw us as super sensitive souls who had nothing better to do in our lives and complain about noise. Now, I think the fact that aircraft noise groups at Heathrow, Gatwick, right around the country, have over the last 20 years literally made a noise about aircraft noise. And we may come to this later, and, and, and it's been backed up by the World Health Organization. I think they do now understand that noise is not just a real problem for people, but it can be a health problem. Mm. So the generation, and it is a different, it may be a generational change, actually, Lisa, it, it, the generation of civil servants who are now heading up the noise team, I think they do understand that. I think they do want to put in place what they can. Now, civil servants, they're constrained, obviously, by, by what government does, what ministers will do. I think the problem at the moment in, in getting better uh, noise con noise conditions, get an amelioration of noise conditions, is perhaps less with the civil servants than with the ministers. I just don't think they see uh, aircraft noise as a uh, big priority. It's a really interesting point because you, you sort of touched on um, the World Health Authority, and I know living under the Gatwick flight path, <laughs> that night flights are just that they have so much of an impact on general health and well-being. I'm only thinking about how I felt when I woke up this morning. I had a relatively restless night, and every time I felt like I was near enough going to sleep, one of these night flights came in and it stopped me from going going to sleep, and then I was irritated. And you know, I, I felt it all all day. Um, so do you know if you know do do we feel that that's really understood by the by the airports or is it just nodded through as a an issue that affects us i think they understand it's an issue i think there's pressures on them not to do anything too very much about it i, I think they just I, I remember shortly after i started with haycan I, I i said to heathrow i said look if you really want to decimate haycan get rid of night flights because two thirds of our people are probably joining us because of night flights. It, it, it's an issue. Now, I think, they, I think they do understand it's an issue uh, and probably more so now with the World Health Organization uh, uh, kind of reinforcing what we've all been saying over many years. There is amongst the, amongst the airport is an unwillingness to do anything about it because they're, they're their customers, the airlines, are so keen on night flights. Now, Gatwick has different customers from Heathrow. For Heathrow, the night flights uh, are long distance flights from uh, the west of America, from the Far East, from Australia. For the airlines that operate them, it's largely British, uh, British Airways, they argue that they're commercially very important to them. And so they put pressure on the airport to at least retain the number of night flights they've got. And with Gatwick, it's uh, where I, I believe there's flights throughout the night. It tends to be more the, uh, the holiday flights, 
the charter flights. But the, the, those, those airlines argue that it's operationally very useful for them to have those flights because it makes their whole business more sustainable. So they also, for slightly different reasons, are putting pressure on their airports. And, uh, and the airports uh, are in the situation where they, they feel they've got to listen to their customers, but equally they do recognize now, though they may not always admit it publicly, they do recognize that it is it's a real issue uh, for many residents. So many of us living under the Gatwick flight path um, believe that there is a night ban at Heathrow. Is that right? Well, it's it's in, in theory, but not necessarily in practice. I, I mean, the, the theory, Lisa, is that there should be no night flights between 11.30 at night and at 4.30 in the morning. The problem we've got is that when flights arrive late, they take off late into the evening. So they're, they're beyond 11.30. Now, I'm not quite sure the latest situation, but uh, under pressure from the residents, the, the number of the late runners, as they're called, was falling. And uh, uh, John Holland Kay, the chief executive, was making it a bit of a priority to deal with them. Uh, but they still, they still existed. Mm. We probably have very few flights at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. Uh, the, the time that are allowed to start landing is 4.30. And <clears throat> there's averaged over the year, there's allowed to be 17 landings uh, between 4.30 and six o'clock. So there's, in theory, a bit of a ban. Um, we are much better off, for example, than, uh, you know, I think yourselves at Gatwick, which is uh, flights all night, or someone like uh, 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 Armel and I were on a, on a, on a uh, European call on Saturday, and we were hearing that in Paris, I think it's 159 night flights. Now, that may be from 11 to 7, but they have a lot of freight flights, so Heathrow hasn't got a ban, but it's a little bit better off than some airports. Mm. But even the Heathrow um, time then is later maybe than when actually research shows that our melatonin peak kicks in, which is somewhere between 10 and 10.30. Yeah, no, in, ab in, ab in absolutely evening. right. Uh, absolutely yeah. right. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's again, it's for the convenience uh, of the airlines rather for the convenience of the passengers. And, and there was work done at the other end, of, at the beginning of the day, showing that in London, most people were getting uh, waking up and beginning to get up at about I think the the, the, the most popular time for getting up in London um, is six forty five. Now, if you're that's a long way past four thirty in the morning. Absolutely, absolutely, and yeah, a, a, absolutely. And and when we talk about sort of the melatonin peak to go to to bed with and getting up with your cortisol peak, that's not when the cortisol is peaking. So it's really encouraging people to be waking up before their bodies are, are ready, and really draining their bodies if they're woke, woken up. By no, I, I think that's right. I, I think the other thing, Lisa, it's it's, I said it's true that everybody is not who lives under a fly path is not woken up by night flights. Uh, and certainly with the Haycan members, and probably the same with uh, your members, um, some people can sleep through the night flights, and they'll say to me, night flights are no problem, John. It's the constant noise during the day that's the problem. So I think the airlines um, will say, well, they argue, well, just how many people really are affected by night flights? Yeah. Now, I think we would argue there's far too many affected by night flights, but the fact that by naturally everyone's not affected by night flights really does give them a little bit of a get out of a jail free card mm. so really i mean the, the noise during the day and the noise at night really seems to come down to a balance between profit and health i i i think that i think that's right and um when i was at haken we commissioned a study from uh an independent dutch consultancy called CE Delft, which tried to assess the cost of night flights at Heathrow. And um, I mean, it was a very honest study, and they found that on balance, probably 
there were slightly more economic gains than there were health disbenefits, but it was very touch and go. But you're absolutely right. That that is the that's the equation. Mm. And I think the other thing that we find quite interesting when we talk to people is people's different um, levels of acceptance in relation to noise. Yeah. They're like what you were talking about, about, you know, the, the, the flights and then the, the laundry and different <laughs> people being affected significantly by different amounts of noise. Is that something that you've identified in your work with Heathrow? No. Uh, uh, absolutely, at Heathrow and with the UK Noise Association, not only are people affected by different levels, people can be affected by different noises. Uh, so uh, th th there's somebody who uh, I know lives under the flight path and, and, and he tells me, look, it doesn't really worry me, John, but when I was a student and lived on Tottenham Court Road and all the traffic was going by, I, I was going crazy. So, uh, and this, this is... <coughs> This is part of the problem that um, it, unlike air pollution, which tends to affect people fairly uniformly because air pollution is air pollution is air pollution. Uh, you know, maybe if you've got a, if, you, if, if you're a little bit under the weather, it affects you more, but if, if, basically it's air pollution. Uh, because of these variations in noise and how people respond to noise for, for different reasons, uh, I think it does allow um, governments to say, well, actually, is noise really a big problem for a huge number of people? Is it people who are particularly sensitive to noise? And the big one they come up with is noise is a local issue. Now, noise is a local issue, obviously. It, it affects us in our localities. But as you said at the beginning, noise is so widespread across across the UK, across Europe, across across the world, indeed, that I think it has to be regarded also as a national issue. Yes, a local issue, mm -hmm. but we need national politicians to take uh, uh, policies to deal with uh, uh, the noise and, and fitting uh, and local solutions will fit into that national framework. And it's that national framework uh, which is missing, not just an aircraft noise, but uh, across the board. Mm. And that fits nicely with, I'm, I'm sure you've heard it a lot, John, as well, we sometimes hear, well, you shouldn't live near an airport then. <laughs> yes, I, I hear it all the time. I, I, I mean, people, <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's, yes, there are so many answers to that. Um, first of all, uh, people like myself live, live 18 miles from the airport and we didn't move, choose to move under a flight path, the flights uh, largely came to us. There, there, were, might, there might have been a few, but there wasn't the incessant noise. So that's one group of people. But people don't always have choices. And, you know, I can think of Heathrow, I can probably it's the same at, at Gawick, it's, it's certainly the same at most of the large European airports. People who work at the airport, sometimes in low paid jobs, they almost need to live near the airport. They can't afford long journeys on uh, sometimes non-existent buses at 4.30 in the morning and not because they're shift workers. Uh, they, they can't have, cabs are out of the question. So, so people don't have, a lot of people, some people have choices. I, I, don't, I, I don't want to you know, say people don't because some people do have choices and we've got to be, I think there's no point as hiding that. But there's a huge number of people who don't really have choices. They can't really move. Um, a, a good example is in Glasgow, where um, a flight path in Glasgow goes over at Clyde Bank, which is the old Docklands, uh, 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 old docks area uh, of the Clyde. And it's, it's, it's a pretty deprived area. And uh, I've been over the years up there speaking with the people and they're saying to me, look, we don't have much money. My auntie lives down the road. She is dependent on me uh, doing her uh, shopping for her twice a week. If I were to move away, what would happen to auntie? So there are all those complex reasons why I just think people move to an area and really it's it, far too easy to say 
and you could you could move away because in many cases that's just not the reality of life and we talk about as well you know that with, with the looming second runway at Gatwick um, and the Gatwick plan for you know the master plan of three runways what does that actually do to the value of people's properties anyway and at what point do you potentially think that it's the right time to get out and that the plans aren't going to affect the value of your house and, and it's a terribly hard decision for people it, it's a position we should, shouldn't really be put into um and it, it's quite hard to get um authoritative figures on the link between uh, aircraft noise new runways and property prices and uh, when when um uh, and, and campaigners who who meet the, the palm for transport over the years have been pressing for this and we still really haven't got uh, proper answers. I think Lisa probably depends a little bit on, uh, I don't think it's a one size fits all, because, you know, property prices in London, for example, are, are have, have been high, the market has been buoyant. Uh, places like Richmond and Kew, which are well off, houses right out of the flight path, sell for a million pounds. But in other areas, where the economy may not be so buoyant and the market is not so buoyant, uh, there are, it's, it's a very different it's a very different situation. But I, I do think it's incumbent upon um, governments to do really proper surveys. I can understand they may not want to survey survey the whole country, but we do need something a, a little bit more rigorous than we've got right now. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think, you know, from our point of view, our wonder is, will there be any areas left in the southeast that will be completely free of aircraft noise after the modernisation of airspace? Um, you know, wh wh where is this going to end? Will there be a place in the southeast where we could live without aircraft noise? It, it's a really good point. I, I, there was a, a young man who was, who was a, a, a member of Haycamp and he got really disturbed by the noise and he said, I'm, I'm going to move. Where can I move in the southeast? So he um, he he thought Br Brighton will, Brighton will do just fine, and you know Brighton is not really heavily overflown. But for him, because he's been sensitised to the noise, one Saturday afternoon I got this panic phone call from him. He said, "I'm on Brighton. I'm on Brighton Beach." I said, "That's nice for you." No, it's not. I've just heard two planes come over, <laughs> and so in some senses, for most people living in Brighton, not a problem, yeah. but. But for people who become sensitized to the noise, mm -hmm. you re many people want to move away from the noise completely. And that is increasingly difficult uh, around London and the Southeast. Mm. And obviously, you know, lockdown for all of us with the quiet skies was very joyful if we're used yes. to um, aircraft noise and what we saw was that there were still um, houses going up in in, in lockdown um, in in the Gatwick area and people were buying some of these properties with very quiet skies and then as planes have increased post lockdown the anger around sort of the, the, the mis-selling if you like of the quiet sky has really started to kick in for some people that have bought new properties that are affected by aircraft noise no i, I think that's right and, and and when when people don't expect something don't change is important you know they they they, they weren't expecting these these planes they weren't getting them and suddenly there was change they became aware of them and they're in a very difficult situation uh I was speaking to somebody at uh, Schiphol Airport in, in the Netherlands. Uh, he and his young wife bought a home uh, just outside Amsterdam in, at COVID. They didn't really think about aircraft noise. There weren't any aircraft. And suddenly, you know, it's one after the other. And the whole family is quite distressed. Yeah. And I have to say, as the plane started ramping up and I'm on a very noisy part of um, Gatwick so I'm on the glide um, but as lockdown began to ease I started to question how I lived with the aircraft noise before Covid and I also wondered whether I would get, ever get used to it again to a point where <coughs> I wasn't constantly feeling irritated and having that heightened sensitivity about the planes as they were starting to to come over. <laughs> It, it, it's interesting, and, and I think, to be quite honest, I think uh, people in the industry were were 
asking the same questions, you know, what, what will happen? Certainly we're getting from London City Airport, people saying, oh, the planes are worse than ever. Now they're not actually, because there aren't so many as there were uh, in 2019 before lockdown, but people are hearing them because their periods are uh, quiet. What I think on this, Lisa, is that I don't, I think if we'd suddenly gone from, if we, if we suddenly went back after COVID to what we had before COVID, the number of planes, then I think it would have been a problem. But the fact that they, they've gradually increased, I suspect probably means it's, it's less of a problem than otherwise would have been. Yeah. And I've got a question for you, John, and you might not know the answer to this, but an intuitive response. <laughs> I'll, from, make, from I'll, you. Make, I'll make it up if I don't. <laughs> good, per per perfect. That's what a good interviewee always does. <laughs> <laughs> so you're obviously affected by Heathrow noise. And Heathrow, to us that live in the southeast, feel as though the area around Heathrow is generally busier, louder, you know, more, more noise. When you come to Gatwick, do you identify that the noise is worse because it's generally quieter in the background or does it not make any difference to you? I'm only asking because, you know, there's that piece of research about the fact that rural areas actually impact noise um, experience noise more significantly because the background noise is lower? No, it's a really good question. And, and, and I think the background noise is important. Um, I, I remember going to uh, speak some years ago at East Midlands Airport where there was, uh, where they changed the flight paths and suddenly people were on the flight path. And the area around East Midlands, if you take out the planes, is really quiet. It's rural Leicestershire. And it was I, the person I was staying with. I, I, I said, what, what's that background noise? Oh, he said, that's Leicester. That's the traffic in Leicester. And it's 15 miles away. And, and they were hearing it because it was so quiet in rural Leicestershire. So I, I, I think, yes, I think the difference between a, the background noise and the noise of whatever it is, an aeroplane or a car or, or what have you, it, it, it does make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, and, I, and I think that is, I think it's beginning to be understood. I think it is understood because, you know, it's, it, it, it's accurate. I, I think the problem may be that in rural areas, uh, the, 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 the authorities say, well, fewer people live there. So even although, uh, the background noise is low. A few people live there. We're not going. We're not going to get so many complaints. Yeah, and it's a, that, that's a really interesting point about complaints. And we could talk all night about whether um, Gatwick take our complaints seriously enough, or whether we're just ignored because we complain too much and therefore we're not <laughs> counted. Um, but thinking about the impact on you know people's health and on house prices, can can an airport ever compensate people enough for the aircraft noise? Probably not. Probably not everybody. I mean, it, it goes back a little bit to what I was saying earlier, that some people are less sensitive to the noise. And, you know, they may feel that if they get uh, proper insulation, that they're compensated enough. But I think for people who are really disturbed by the noise, I think it's very, very difficult. I, I, I'm not opposed to compensation and mitigation because it does make life more livable. It, it is important, particularly for the people we were talking about earlier on who don't have the choices uh, to, to move away. It, it's, uh, it, it is quite important, so I, I, but it's a, it, it's a good question. I don't think for someone who's really disturbed by the noise, they can be, they can be fully compensated, no. Mm. Yeah, it's a really interesting one, isn't it? We were talking about sort of the balance between profit and health, but can can, can it be mitigated by money or compensation? Is a really interesting. I, I don't think I don't think so. Um, I, I, no, I, I I don't think so. It, it, you, the airport could buy up properties, and you know, as uh, 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 Armel again will know very from personal experience, uh, Heathrow wanted to buy up properties for a third runway and were prepared to buy up more properties who will be affected by the noise. So in that sense, they are removing you from the noise, but they're also 
removing you from your community. So it's yeah. it's uh, um, it's 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 a difficult one. Mm. And how do you feel, John, about the the claim that planes are getting quieter? And we all know that planes are getting quieter, but are <laughs> they quiet enough to make a difference to us? No, they're, 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 they're not. They're, they're not. I mean, we have seen, you know, as people will know, over the last uh, 40, 50 years, there's been, a, there's been there has been a step change. But there's no indication that we're going to see a similar step change in the future. I think the figure that the CAA is still uh, talking about is on average, planes will get about quite a, by about one decibel, one dB a, a year. Now, uh, that is negligible. Uh, it, 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 three dBs, you can hardly hear, the human ear can hardly hear it. Once you get to six or seven decibels, six or ten decibels, then it does make a significant difference. Now, the, there are, I'll give you an example from London City Airport, which is introducing new, new, new planes. And on the immediate area of departure for the first four miles or so, there will be a six decibel decrease in the noise. Now that will be significant for those people, but for everybody else, it'll be one or two decibels. So it's not really significant. and. If you increase the number of planes, as most airports would want to do, and you're only uh, decreasing the noise by one or two decibels, actually, it's going to be as bad or worse than it is right now. Because, you know, you, you know yourself, Lisa, it's the, it's the number of planes people complain about these days. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's the constant noise. And uh, to deal with that, the planes would have to be much quieter than they are than they than they're going to be in the future on present projections and that's why i guess you know some of the compensation schemes or the support schemes that gatwick have offered in the past in relation to you know insulation and double glazing um some interesting comments in the in the chat that double glazing only helps when the windows are closed <laughs> and we can't and we can't live our lives um in our homes with our windows always closed and we can't double glaze our gardens to be able to ex experience you know um our gardens in the way that we want to so it's a really interesting point that some of these compensation stroke support schemes actually only work if people change how they live in their homes yeah, I think that's 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 an astute point. That 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 that's that that's right. Um, as I said earlier, I, I don't knock mitigation schemes because I think they do help people, but they they're always going to be limited. And uh, as you said just now, so they might, in fact, they will uh, encourage people to live if they can different lives uh, than they otherwise would. The lives are almost. Um, been determined by the aeroplanes. Uh, now everyone's life can't be determined by the aeroplanes because they've got to do things. But 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 it, it, that's a situation which people really shouldn't be put into. And do, do do Heathrow do anything that you think? Do you know what Gatwick should really do that? It, you know, it, it really helps <laughs> helps us Heathrow people that you know are, are are struggling and actually you know the people at Gatwick would benefit from that is there anything positive that Gatwick can learn from how Heathrow is well, Amel here is furious who's, 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 who's lived beside Heathrow much time been in this business much longer than me is furiously shaking her head um, <laughs> I I probably don't quite know enough about the current the current uh, engagement or otherwise that Gatwick has with the residents uh, to, to answer that truthfully um, I, I think that I may, I may not agree with this, but I think there has certainly been a an improvement in the way he throws a gate with residents over 20 years. Uh, I, I think some of that was uh, as a result of losing the Battle of the Third Railway in 2010. They realized that they had to engage more. Um, so, but I, I'm not really probably au fait enough with the current situation at Gatwick to, to make a, a sensible comparison. No, that's fine. So in relation to the work that Cagney does, 
Um, you know, John, that we don't seek to move noise over, over any other community. Um, and that is quite unusual in the battle against noise. <laughs> and I wonder if that's a human, human survival, is that we're happy <laughs> to push our noise over somebody else if it gives us a respite. Because Cagney is unusual. And it's quite hard to come across people that are campaigning in our area that will sign up to that. They, they, a lot of these groups seem to be content only to campaign on one area or one location and become much more silent when the noise moves from over the top of their head. It, 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 it is really interesting. I mean, I mean, hey, hey Canada, that start as well, that we were, uh, you know, we were dealing with all noise all over London. Uh, and but at this conference that uh, Armel and myself and I think one or two other people on the call were at uh, the European Core conference on Saturday, there was a really interesting contribution from a guy from Brussels. Now, if we think we have got NIMBY problems in our airports, it's nothing like Brussels because it's not just NIMBY problems. The French hate the Flemish and the Flemish think the French are putting it over them. And it's just, it, it's horrendous. And he was really, he was very impressive. And he said, look, what we've done is we've tried to sit down and think, what are the common asks that we can all sign up to? So the common, a couple of them came out. There were, there were more than this, but a, a couple stood out. One he said was, everyone wants what he called a phasing out of night flights. Everyone also was looking for a cap on the, an annual cap on the number of flights allowed to use the airport. He also argued for a cap on the number of flights allowed per hour. Now, th there were one or two other issue, things as well, but essentially what he was driving at was, uh, what are the issues that everyone can sign up to? Hmm. Now, I think that's probably the only way forward. It, I don't think, to be quite honest, Lisa, it will totally eliminate NIMBY attitudes, but it will help. And if one can unite, if we can get some sort of unity around these, they're probably the big demands, the overall demands, the framework type demands, uh, then I think it will, it can bring people together and it can put more pressure on the airports. Yeah, I think you make a really good point that actually I think communities lose power when we split. Yeah. When, we when we begin to split our campaign from the, the big key issues and start to localise, sometimes we, we lose the power of number, don't we? Um, and you've obviously been very involved in Heathrow, but we know that you've also had a lot of experience overseas. At international airports. What yes. can we learn from from them? Well, there's, I think there's a number of things. I mean, I've got to say that um, a, a lot of the, not all, but a lot of the uh, aviation campaigners in Europe have been looking to the UK uh, because they do think that uh, in some ways we are uh, we are ahead of them. Okay. But uh, but in uh, partly because in, in, in some cases there is just no engagement whatsoever. Um, but I think there are things we can we can learn. Uh, I, I think the Belgian example I, I, I've just given, uh, I think the, the, the other people who are the it tends to come in it tends to come in in waves. There's particular countries where, you, who are taking the lead at one particular time, and then there's somebody else. I think at the moment, there's a lot of interesting stuff happening in the Netherlands and at Schiphol. They have um, the pressure on their government to uh, actually reduce the, reduce the number of flights allowed uh, each year. It was 500,000, it's now 440,000. Now that is a huge step. We're all talking about a cap, but they're actually reducing the cap. And um, the organization which I, I, I'm vice chair of, which is called, it's got an even worse name at least than Haycan. It's called, it's called UECNA, U-E-C, 
N A. It's it, it's the catchy it's, one, John. Hey. Oh, it's really catchy. It's really catchy. <laughs> and you'll be glad I can't speak French because it's got some. It's, it's a long, it's long, <laughs> long French words. But it's it is worth looking at their website because it's got um, it's got comparisons of what's happening across Europe. It and it's got uh, one of the things Yetna tries to do is uh, its network is bring people together. That that that's its role, or, or one of its key roles. And it, it's worth looking at that, keeping an eye on it, uh, because there's a lot of good information there, which which touches on the sort of points you've been raising, Lisa. Brilliant. Well, we've got some really good um, questions coming up in the chat. I just want to ask one um, final question before we move move on to, to those. Um, I often think that electric cars are very quiet compared to diesel and petrol cars. Can we expect um, any changes in noise if we see um, aircraft moving to more sustainable fuels well, and it, different it, ways. I, I think, it, I think it's, it's one of the most relevant questions because um, I, I think because the emphasis of, of, of the industry, of governments, is on making planes cleaner for, for perfectly understandable climate change reasons. And, but if you read all the articles in the papers about electric and hydrogen, it's all about how will they do, reduce CO2. There's very, sometimes you go read an entire article and there's nothing about whether it'll reduce or increase noise. Mm -hmm. And I, I suspect there, I suspect there will be some reduction in noise uh, from uh, perhaps some of the electric planes. But we had a you have to put on a, a webinar from a, a really good one, a, a young man who's a, a climate change campaigner, but has was trained a, a, a aviation engineer, and he was he was saying actually it's it's. For most, for most planes, except perhaps a small electric planes, I mean that they, they may they may be quieter and cleaner, but for for most of the planes, choices will have to be made, and choices will have to be made whether to make the planes uh, more CO two uh, friendly or quieter. And he said, right now, the uh, because of where where politics is at, it will be favouring CO two. So there, I, I think. That that trade off is something that we're all going to have to watch very very carefully because I think it's going to be one of the coming issues over the next decade. Interesting, John. Thank you. We've got a nice question um, in the the chat um, from Aidan. Um, he said, "Hi, John. Brilliant, brilliant session. So thank you. So I'll pass his thanks on on to you." Um, so he <laughs> thanks, appears Aidan. to all. <laughs> Heathrow appears to already be in a built-up area, but here in Crawley, we are still prey to housing development in the current countryside, which will be impacted by Gatwick aircraft noise. This is being denied and ignored by the potential developer, which ironically is a government agency. Do you have any advice on how to oppose and resist these sorts of proposed developments on the ground of aircraft noise? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it is a good point, and, and it is something... It's disappointing to hear that because it is something that the Department for Transport is talking about. It is something that I know um, Heathrow was very, very interested in uh, when they were last time they were planning for a third runway. And essentially what, what government is trying to say is that there should be a minimal amount of build under flight paths uh, or under potential flight paths. Um, in I think as a, a recognition in, in some areas, particularly, but 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 less so where you are, I think, probably in, in built up areas like London or Manchester, where it's actually it maybe quite difficult not to build under a potential flight path. Uh, but it should be avoided if you if it if it can be. And I would have thought in the if it's the Gatway countryside, uh, and uh, that Aiden is absolutely right. The, the, there should be it, it needn't happen if that's where the flight path could be uh it, it, it government is effectively saying that shouldn't be happening so that's it's really disappointing that a government agency is uh, kind of ignoring its own advice yeah absolutely 
it's that battle between one government department and, an, and another is what it feels like. <laughs> I think that's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, Brilliant. yeah. Lovely. Thank you, John. And um, we've got a question from Armel. Um, so if you'd like to come off mute and ask John your question, that would be great. Um, we've probably got a few more people wanting to ask questions, so we'll try and get as many in as possible. OK, no, so, sorry. Good evening, Lisa. I was trying evening. to... Uh, to chat and but we've got a problem I, I live in Harmon's West which is next to Heathrow and we've got problems with the uh, internet at the moment so most of what John said actually um, I agree um, what John I mean John knew my husband my husband was a founder member of BEA in 1946 when you start at seven o'clock in the morning or when you finish at 11 because we were all at the airport working on uh, on shift you have to be you were asking you know, why are you living near the airport? Well, in 90, I mean, when I came here in 1969, you know, we either went by bicycle or we walked. Uh, yes. You know, you might have had the, the, odd, the, the odd bus. So you didn't have the chance to leave 20 or 30 miles away because you had to be there at yeah. seven o'clock and probably even before because you had to be ready for your shift. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing John said that I probably would disagree and actually I don't, there has been quite a lot of engagement with his row hey, it doesn't get us anywhere. So there is plenty of engagement, but we don't get anywhere. So that's mm. another thing. The other thing you mentioned is about being, uh, um, uh, you know, the number of houses. I, I had that meeting with Heathrow yesterday and, and the group of people who are all uh, anti-expansion and anti-noise. Um, and we come from all different areas. We all have different problems. And you are very right. They cannot separate us because we each uh, uh, accept what every oil's problem is and and they have I said it to the one director yesterday you know we work very well because we all accept that we have to give um the other thing that you've mentioned is um so regarding housing uh, I did say to them that actually the the um uh, mayor is you know forcing us to have many, many more housing uh, in London. So more people are going to be impacted in the future and, you know, with their airspace change. And the other thing I wanted to reassure you is yesterday I brought to that meeting that we want uh, Gatwick, Heathrow and, um, and City to actually sit together at one meeting so we can all hear what everybody else, you are not certainly body and you are very much, and you were in my mind yesterday, not because I attend your meeting, but because it's the right thing to do. And yeah. we all have to learn to have a bit of noise. If the airports are bringing a lot of benefits, everybody's got to have a little bit of this benefit. Mm. And you know, it, it's not going to work unless we've got no aviation. Yeah. But, you know, please be assured, and John was saying, we, you know, we've attended a lot of these UK ECNA meetings where we've got some very, very good speaker. But there was a gentleman who actually said uh, he's in London and when he doesn't have his throw, he's got Gatwick. 24 yeah. hours a day with no respite. Yeah. I did bring, bring that in yesterday. Yeah. Because That's a really he, interesting point, Amel. And I ooh, wonder if um, John's got any thoughts on how sort of the campaign groups across the different... Um, airports could or should work more efficiently together yeah i mean i, I think i think so I, I i think i think this is uh, we're fortunate in having some umbrella bodies which we didn't have uh you know 25 years ago there's airport watch uh aviation environment federation which is uh, a more of a lobby group but it's it brings people together um there, there is there is there are links um i would encourage us much uh, conversation between the various groups uh, as possible, uh, because I do think the umbrella bodies uh, we can learn from each other. We can learn. From, we can empathise with each other when we when we know each other's problems, uh, and uh, working together we can put more pressure on both the politicians and on the airports. Uh, yeah. So I think it's the more we can do it, uh, the better. And in, and in some ways. Um, we, we were lucky to have these groups because uh, while, while they're, they are in some of the other European countries, notably Germany and, uh, and France to some extent, th there are some 
of European countries which don't have them at all. And, and I think individual airports there, are, airport campaigners are very much losing out. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Thank you, John. Um, another question um, from, from the chat is that when we speak to our local MPs, they seem to put economics before the impact on their voters. What can we, what can we do? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a lot of them instinctively do that. I, I mean, I think it was happening less and less at Heathrow, but that's perhaps because the the um, the community uh, campaign was so, so huge, and 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 many of them did live under the flight paths. Uh, but I I think around the country, this is what's happening. <laughs> I, I feel. It, it, the problem is, is cost for us here, but I, I feel that it is worth trying to take the these economic arguments head on, uh, even if it requires uh, getting together some money for a study. Because I, I think that the powers the powers that be expect us to jump up and down about noise and air pollution, traffic congestion to some extent, climate change. Um, but economics, and we're, and, we're, and we're quite good at jumping up and down about all those things, but economics, sometimes we say, oh, I don't know if that's for us. Well, I think it is for us. And let me just give you quickly one example. When I was with Haycan in 2008-9, uh, uh, we commissioned a study from uh, a consult, independent consultants, which didn't look at whether he throw uh, benefits the economy, because clearly Heathrow does bring some benefits to the economy, but looked at a very specific question. Is a third runway essential for the economy of London? Mm -hmm. And they said, well, no, London will, will carry on just fine without a third runway. And uh, one of the government, at, at the time, you, you remember Labour were in power and the Conservatives were thinking of opposing a third runway. And one of the conservative ministers said to me afterwards, she said, you know, that report was so useful in influencing us. She said, we are the, you know, we're the party of business. We would normally go for expansion. But when we saw that report and we realized that the economics didn't demand it, it made it much easier for us to come out against a third runway to throw. Now, it cost us quite a bit of money. It cost us, I think, in the region of, uh, I, I hope you're all sitting comfortably. I can't see any of you, but sit comfortably for a minute. Um, it, it, it costs the region, I think, totally between thirty and forty thousand mm pounds. -hmm. We got some, we got grant money to help us pay for it, but it really was worth it. But it sounds really powerful, doesn't it? It, it, it was powerful, yeah. and it was, and, and we launched it. We launched it not as a hey can report. But we launched it as a, a CE Delft report because they were the consultants. And we launched it not under the flight path, but we gave financial journalists a, a rather nice and very expensive breakfast in the city of London. So it was seen as economics. It was yeah. seen as finance. It yeah. wasn't seen as environment. Yeah. And seen as independent from a campaigning and, group uh, around noise, which uh, is absolutely. really important. <laughs> I was told, because we clearly commissioned it, I was told, John, you, you're going to have to say a word, but literally only a word. <laughs> then, you <laughs> then, then you disappear and let the, let the economists yeah. talk. Yeah, sometimes we do more good by stepping back, don't we? Yeah, absolutely yeah. right. So another question, um, John, we're just going to try and get a couple more in because there's a couple of really good ones here. Um, could government policy um, regarding the development under flight paths have an impact on Gatwick's DCO? I think it's difficult. I think it's difficult to say because it's a little bit unclear what government policy is right now on aviation. Um, as we know, they were going to come up with uh, they came up with a green I think two thousand eighteen came up with a, a green paper. Um, partly because of COVID, that wasn't followed up. Uh, there was going to be an aviation white paper. Uh, there's been a there's been a zero. Uh, a carbon strategy, but not much else. So I think I think the problem for yourselves and Gatwick is you're 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 operating in this uh, policy vacuum. Mm. Mm. That's an interesting point, actually, which leads quite nicely on to um, another um, question: Should we be putting pressure on airlines as well as airports? Because 
they seem yeah. to be the problem as well. No, ab absolutely, because um, they they kind of, they're, they're they're a step away from us. So they're a step away from the complaints, um, and, and 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 as I was saying about night flights, um, you know, it's it, I think some of the airports left to themselves be quite happy to get rid of night flights because they're cause because we all they're, they're causing them just so much hassle. Uh, but it's the pressure from the airlines, which means that they've got to kind of balance the interests of the airlines and you know, take account of our interests as well. So, yes, I, I, I think uh, definitely put pressure on the airlines. Um, I, I suspect you'll find, we'll all find some of them are more receptive than others to, to talking, but uh, let's not neglect them. Yeah. And the last piece of advice for us, John, what else can we as communities do to be heard? Well, I think it, I think you are being heard. Uh, I, I think one I, I think one of the things that's happened over the last um, 20 years is that communities, their voice is out there. It is being heard, um, whether it, whether it's actually affecting final decisions is, is another matter. Um, I would, uh, in, in the last moment or two, I, I would continue to be high profile because we can't afford to advertise, and we can't afford billboards. The media is our advertising tool. So I would continue to be high profile. I know tag me is. Um, I would um, continue to try and um, bring together as many people as possible in a non-NIMBY fashion, because the more united we are, the stronger we are. And thirdly, I would uh, go back to the point I was making a moment or two ago, uh, try and challenge some of the economics. Perfect, thank you. John, a massive thank you from me for allowing me to fire questions. No, probably no, much easier enjoyed. for me to ask them than it is for you to be put on the spot. No, I thoroughly, I thoroughly enjoyed it, Lisa. Thank you very so much. Thank you very much. And I'm going to pass back to um, Sally Pavey, who is the chair of Cagney, for some final words. Little time delay there. Sorry, but I'm, I'm maneuvering all around the screen. So thank you, that was fascinating. And I'm, I'm great to, to sit back and actually be able to listen uh, instead of uh, actually chairing these meetings. So thank you hugely to, to Lisa. It was really fascinating. I hope everyone found it really interesting. Um, and just to say next week, we have Baroness uh, Jenny Jones talking about air quality. Obviously when an airport comes, you have the uh, small point, the small particles from the airfield, as well as from the roads. So Jenny, with her mountain of, of information on air quality and campaigning in London joins us next week. And then we also have an ex-pilot and an aviation engineer joining us on the Thursday, um, talking about how um, the industry needs to change and actually take responsibility for the impact it's having on our planet. So um, as it's just hit um, half past, I'm going to say a huge thank you to our guest speaker this evening, John Stewart. Um, much appreciated, John, um, for your support and for joining us this evening and giving us an insight into your many years of experience and, 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 and the issue of noise, which um, I'm sure will carry on for many more years to come. Unfortunately, that's, that's a negative. I should let, end on a positive, shouldn't I, Lisa? Sorry. You should. And there's lots of lovely thanks for you as well, John, in the chat. So yeah, everybody well, that's here is also thanking you. Thanks. Well, thank you all very much. I, I, I really did enjoy it. Uh, thank you. Good. And thank you all for attending. And we sincerely hope to see you next week. But if you feel like donating your um, daily coffee during COP27, we would appreciate it. You can do it via our website, which is uh, cagney.org, or the Just Giving page, which is Cagney Gatwick. So um, from me, um, thank you very much and good night. Bye.